Copenhagen. Translated from Danish, it means the Merchant's Harbor. Located at the mouth of the Baltic Sea, it has long been the hub of trade between Scandinavia, Northern Europe, and Russia. Today, its very active port is co-managed with Sweden. We are two uh, brother nations. Close to 30,000 Swedes come to Copenhagen every day to work. According to sociologists, Copenhagen is home to the happiest people in the world. Perhaps this is because the city is focused on the needs of its inhabitants, convenience and humanity. They have decided in the city council that th this city should be the best city for people in the world. The first thing that catches the eye in Copenhagen is its stunning architecture, a breathtaking union of old and new. And then, there are the bicycles, clearly the centerpiece of daily life for pretty much everyone. Every day, Copenhagen is bike around 1.2 million kilometers. What is referred to as the new port of Copenhagen is in reality over 400 years old. New Haven now thrives as the heart of the city, but this cozy inlet and the streets that surround it were once bustling with a different kind of energy. 50 years ago, this was part of Copenhagen where you would only meet drunken sailors and light-footed ladies. But today we call it the longest bar in Copenhagen. With the oldest active monarchy in Europe, Denmark played an important role in the evolution of several other capital cities. And the Vikings that left this port actually set foot in America long before Christopher Columbus did. It's an interesting geographical structure. All the western part of Denmark is a peninsula called Jutland. And then you have 406 islands. In Denmark? Yes. And if we took them all and shoveled them together into one island, Denmark would be just about the same size as Switzerland, 43,000 square kilometers. But we don't have those beautiful mountains you find down in Switzerland. Denmark is flat as a pancake. This natural harbor, so dear to Copenhageners, is the world's first industrial port to be managed by two countries. The Danes share it with their neighbors, the Swedes. We are two uh, brother nations. Today, the integration uh, it works out magnificently, I would say. Close to 30,000 Swedes come to Copenhagen every day to work. Because the salaries are higher. Because partly because the salary is a little higher, it's about 20% different, but it's also because it's easier to, for them to find a job. What I find incredible is that you've built a bridge from yes. Copenhagen to Malmö. Yeah. It's a joint venture of two nations, I would say. But the design of this bridge was faced with a major challenge. The proximity to the airport made it impossible to erect a structure in height. The solution? A four kilometer tunnel leading to a man-made island, and then the bridge to Sweden. You know, the Danes love their boat. The Danes think it's a human right to have a safe boat. And really, how could you not love boats when water is so present throughout the city? Now we are at 
Indians' home. This part of Copenhagen was actually built artificially in 1600 by our king at the time, Christian IV. He was the one who had that dream that Copenhagen should be the trading center for Northern Europe. A little after Amsterdam, he wanted this to be a trading suburb of Copenhagen. He sunk a couple of uh, old warships here. Then he filled them up with garbage from 1600, and then he offered the Copenhageners 12 years where they didn't have to pay tax if they moved out here. You know, in Danish years, music. And he actually succeeded in establishing a whole commercial city. right in the center of the, the port of Copenhagen. Yes, we have actually totally in Denmark about 6,000 wind turbines and they give us 20% of our electricity today. But in the Danish parliament they have decided that before year 2025 we should have at least 35% of our energy coming from the alternative sources. So it's not only the wind but also the sun, the biotechnique, the strength from the waves on the sea. The environment has very high priority in Denmark. But the Danes have more than their wind turbines to be proud of. Their incredibly efficient approach to urban design is now a reference throughout the world. Leading urban planner Jan Gell has been involved in projects as impressive as the redesign of Times Square. He tells me how his city's approach to urban layout focuses on functionality. As you can see, at Copenhagen, we have no high-rise except three of them. They decided very early that we are not doing high-rise. They refused to densify the center and by doing that, all the offices and administrations have been scattered around, which also scatters the traffic. If you build up a fantastic center, then, of course, there'll be a lot of traffic going to the center, and you'll have this big concentration. The center of Copenhagen has a very low density. If you make invitations for bicycling, which have been happening here for 40, 50 years, systematically, it becomes more and more convenient, more and more obvious, and more and more safe to bicycle. And now we are into a situation where 37% of all commuting to and from work happens on the bicycle. Tell me about the health benefits. You calculate them. The city of Copenhagen have made some economic survey about the benefits of bicycling. It's something about that every time a person bicycles a kilometer, the society gains a quarter of a dollar and every time the same kilometer is traveled by a person in a car the society loses 16 cents or something like that and that is a calculating which take into account of course that the infrastructure for bicycles are very cheap that the bicycle in itself is very cheap compared to a car that pedaling is free of charge and the people who bicycle regularly, they live much longer and have fewer uh, hospitalizations and less health expenses. When all this is piled up, they found out that actually it's, it's much better investment for society to have people bicycling than to have people going in motor cars. Copenhagen, I would say, is one of the most walkable cities I've ever seen. Yeah, I think you're right. And, and they, they have done a number of things. They have systematically taken the sidewalks and the bicycle lanes across all the side streets. That means that you more or less stay on the sidewalk. You're not to cross any streets, but the cars are to cross the sidewalks, which is a fantastic difference because, firstly, it tells the pedestrians they're just as important as any person who is in a car and also the bicyclists are just as important. And that means that my grandchild, who is eight years, she can walk to the school now because she can stay on the sidewalk all the time. That is a great difference also for elderly and for wheelchairs and baby strollers. According to Jan, 
A city should be designed for people, not for cars. Copenhagen is so family friendly that outsiders might get the impression there's a permanent baby boom. That's not the case. The city is just very well thought out and structured around a very efficient concept, the finger plan. The finger plan was after the war where there was a big period where nothing happened because there were no, it was not possible to build during the war and whatever. Second World War, if we are talking about, um, they realized that there would be an expansion and also the, the Western world were industrializing and people were moving from the countryside to the cities. So there was a big expansion expected and they were quick enough to formulate the framework for how the plan should be made. They published this plan of organizing the expansion of the city along some transport corridors where you should have a suburban train line and also a freeway in each of these fingers. And that has actually been followed. And the reason why it works here is that we haven't got a big concentration in the middle. Because if we had a big concentration in the middle, all these would be choked. But what has happened is that we have got the finger plan and they have also made a number of ring roads so you can go across the fingers. And one of the benefits of the finger plan, of course, is that you have a decent uh, public transportation for most of the people and also that you can preserve the landscape. It actually has been a very good idea and it's copied many places uh, around the world. How do you calculate the livability of a city? Some of the latest things which has happened in Copenhagen is that they have decided in the city council that th this city should be the best city for people in the world. And also they have another decision that it should be bicycle city number one in the world. To have a livelier city, a safer city, a more attractive city, more friendly people oriented city, but also more sustainable and have a healthier population. And it's really important that people meet other people in society face to face and that you actually come out and be part of society and see who the other fellows are in the city. By making very nice spaces, it's more and more natural that you come out and actually spend time. In a city like this one, when we ask people 30 years ago, why are you in the city? They would say, I'm in the city to shop. But now the majority would say, I'm in the city to be in the city. The reason for going into the city has changed from a purposeful thing to a more leisure-oriented thing. They go into the city to see what's going on and to have a good time to enjoy. And then they also shop. But that's not the major purpose anymore. So the city public spaces become a destination in their own right. A few years ago, my wife and I celebrated 45 years anniversary. And it was a summer day in August, and we thought that we will go into the city to have a good dinner to celebrate. And then we took our bikes, and then we, and we are not quite, quite young anymore. Actually, we were close to 140 years put together. So we took our bikes, and then we, we pedaled leisurely into the city. We looked at a lot of nice places and then we found a good place, had our dinner, and then we went back. When we came back, we realized we have done 19.8 kilometers on bicycle. And then we talked about that doing such a trip in our advanced age and doing it safely and whatever, that would not have been possible when we were married. I have this strong feeling that for all this period of time, every morning when I woke up, the city was a little bit better than yesterday. While in many other cities I've been to, you have this feeling that tomorrow is a little bit worse than yesterday. Um, and that would primarily be in the cities where they have not done anything to curb the traffic, because then you will see that every day there will be 100 more cars than yesterday and they will try to find a room and, and squeeze through and the noise level will raise and the pollution and uh, the dangers, whatever, will, will raise. 
While in Copenhagen, actually, it's been going the other way. It's become better and better. And if things are getting better, it's partly because everyone here agrees on one thing. The bicycle. The bicycle is truly a phenomenon here. This simple and almost free mode of transportation is by far the city's most valuable asset. With more than one bike per person, Copenhagen has become the cycling capital of the world. What percentage of Copenhageners wear bike helmets? In general, in Denmark, we say that 15% wear helmets. Our first priority is not to make sure that people wear a helmet when they have an accident, it's to avoid the accident. Um, so therefore, we work very seriously with the traffic safety and education of cyclists. Is bicycle theft a big problem here? Um, yes or no. Uh, many bicycles only have very simple locks. I think, yeah, this bicycle, for and instance, has a very, uh, a very small lock. And it's not attached to anything? It's not attached to anything. The Danes want it quick and simple. They don't want complicated, big locks that are heavy to transport. Do people cycle for ecological reasons? I think it's only around 5% who state that it's because of the environment that they bicycle. Everyone knows that it's good for environment, but that's not your main consideration in the morning when you're late for work and when you're doing your budgets or whatever. What are bike butlers? Bike Butlers is this new innovative project that we have uh, set up in order to include more service in what we do for cyclists. Not only constructing infrastructure, but also making it a nice experience to bicycle. We saw that at the metro stations, the bikes were parked chaotically and uh, some bikes were also blocking for emergency exits. So we hired uh, butlers to tidying up uh, all the parked bicycles and also just to grease the chains and to pump the tires of the bicycles that were parked. And then people were left a little note saying, I pumped your tire, I hope you will park your bike in the right place <laughs> next time. Most of the population bikes. I mean, I think it's uh, over 80% that has access to a bicycle. And 50% of the inhabitants of, of Copenhagen bike to work or education. And I heard something like 96% of children own a bike. Yes. Every train has two uh, wagons for bicycles, the first one and the last one. And it's free to take your bicycle in the trains. What is it also free to take your bicycle on? Uh, you can't take it on the buses because often buses cover shorter distances, which you can easily do by bicycle. And in the metro, it's uh, limited in the rush hours. And all the taxis have two bike racks at, yes. the, at the back. And you pay a very small fee. After the oil crisis of the 70s, Copenhagen introduced measures to minimize its dependence to fuel. For many here, the cargo bike has become a permanent alternative to the automobile. What are the different types of cargo bikes? Um, this is sort of the classic type of Danish cargo bike with two wheels in the front and a big box and then one wheel at the back. And this brand is called Nihola and uh, they have produced cargo bikes since uh, 1990. We estimate 19,000 cargo bikes in Copenhagen. So it's every six of all families with children who own one. So this is good for two kids and they're uh, two equipped kids, with seat belts. A picnic basket or a case of beer, a dog maybe, and then you're off. We call them cargo because they have the, sa the shape and the size of a car and it fits four cargo bicycles uh, inside. And so as you can see, families are using it right now. Each corner holds a cargo bicycle. They have their own personal key so that they can lock it and open it. And here, 
citizens can send an SMS and say what they think about the cargo bike facility. You also have a website where people can send feedback as to the condition of the bicycle paths. Yes. Um, if citizen, citizens discover like a small hole in the bicycle track or a ramp that, they, that is missing, things that wouldn't fit in into the big budgets that we have for big infrastructure projects, then they can mark it on an online map and tell us, hey, I would like you to fix that, that hole. And then once in a while, our repair crew, they go out and they fix all these little things. How many kilometers of bike paths are there in Copenhagen? In the municipality of Copenhagen, we have 346 kilometers of bike path. And if you count the greater Copenhagen area, it's around 1,000 kilometers of bike path. So every day, Copenhagen is bike around 1.2 million kilometers. Tell me about the green wave. Basically, the traffic lights are synchronized for cyclists. In uh, some of the major streets of Copenhagen, where we have up to 30,000 cyclists a day, instead of uh, adjusting the signals to cars, we adjust them to the speed of bicycles, so that once you hit this major street, you don't have to stop for a very long time. And wait, there's even more. At street lights, bicycles wait ahead of the cars and even get a green light a few seconds before their fuel-powered counterparts. That's road safety for you. We have just started up a big collaboration with the 18 municipalities in the greater Copenhagen region to make what we call bike highways in order to, to connect different municipalities so that when you reach a munis municipal border, the bicycle track does not end. Actually, you have very good facilities. If you live far away from your work, you can still go by bicycle. Michael Colville Anderson can safely be referred to as the Danish bicycle ambassador. He's the author of the busiest blog in the industry, CopenhagenCycleChic.com Basically, cargo bikes serve as everything. They have espresso machines on them, there are sushi cargo bikes. What else is there? There's no limit to the imagination. In the past 10 years, we've seen a, a massive growth in the number of cargo bike users. Um, and you know, people's creativity has, has followed suit. Yeah. You can eat and drink your way through Copenhagen with things from bicycles. You know, there's, there's crepe bicycles, pancake bicycles, bicycles selling water in the summer, newspaper bicycles selling uh, foreign newspapers uh, to tourists, uh, sushi bikes on the beach serving chilled sushi. There's one guy in Copenhagen who uh, he has the cocktail bike. He shows up uh, if you text him and you go to his website to read the, the code, 2L Mojito, you know, two liters of Mojito. Um, and he'll he'll ride out to you with uh, with with the cocktails, and you pay with the wireless with your card and uh, you know a deposit for the thermoses, and then he disappears again. You know whatever you need, you can get it from a bike, and that's really ex uh, uh, something that is really unique to Copenhagen. Car ownership is only 29% in Copenhagen, um, so if you have kids, you have to have a, some form of cargo bike. Everybody I know with kids, they all have a cargo bike. Maybe they use a car sometimes to get to work or whatever, but to get around with kids, you know. With my work also, if I have equipment to transport around or, or groceries, you know, I'm, I'm quite often on the cargo bike. I also have like a regular bike, but, um, but this is just so practical for urban living in Copenhagen. And what happens if it rains? You get wet, <laughs> basically. <laughs> um, you know, you go to work or whatever and- You still uh, take out the bike? Oh yeah, of course. Um, not, nothing changes really. It's quite a maybe a Nordic thing, you know, your mother, when you're growing up, you know, there's no, no such thing as bad weather, there's only bad clothing. So, you know, what, what we do on our bikes is the same as if we're pedestrians, you know. Pedestrians get wet if it rains, if they don't have an umbrella. I mean, you just walk, ride around in your regular clothes. There's no, there's no difference on a bike or on foot. The city of Copenhagen uh, has determined that 80% uh, continue cycling all winter. And um, if there's a wicked snowstorm rolling in from, from Sweden or the Arctic, yeah, the number will drop a bit, but you still have about a couple hundred thousand people riding their bike to work in a snowstorm. And it's true that the city clears the bike paths of snow before the streets? Absolutely. It started as, as, as a way of encouraging people to ride, um, and it ended up with a necessity now, because if you have all of these hundreds of thousands of people who ride a bike every day, if the bike lanes aren't cleared in the morning in a snowstorm, 
um, there's a couple hundred thousand people standing at bus stops or at train stations and the public transport system would implode, you know, so it, it's a necessity now. It's a design country, Copenhagen, so if you design bicycle infrastructure well, people don't have to break the rules. You know, a lot of people will jump red lights in other cities because they're protecting themselves. You know, they're afraid that that car didn't see them and they're gonna, you know, turn right without looking. Absolutely. So it is, I mean, I'm not, I'm not justifying running red lights. Uh, people are taking care of themselves, so they're gonna roll through the red light in order to be ahead of those cars that are coming up behind. Um, but once you create an infrastructure that is well designed, people behave. Um, once you encourage the mainstream uh, to ride bicycles, they just want to go to work quickly. So they will, you know, that's what you see here. It's just regular citizens, you know. Once you, once you broaden the, uh, the demographics of who's cycling in the city, people start behaving. I like to always say we don't have any cyclists in Copenhagen, we just have a lot of people who use bicycles, bicycle users. In many countries, it's a, a fetish object for like a, a variety of subcultures, you know, they, they love their bicycles, they polish them and all, and that's great, but um, but here, it's a workhorse, it's a tool, like a vacuum cleaner. Um, the so, Danes are into practicality. Absolutely, you know, and uh, if, your bike, if your bike gets stolen or if it you know, falls apart, you might get it repaired or you might just buy a new one. In Denmark, every year we scrap 400,000 bicycles and we buy 500,000 new, and so we don't, we don't take it very seriously. Some people have nice bikes. We spend more on our bikes than any other country in the world, but... Um... Copenhagen. Translated from Danish, it means the Merchant's Harbor. Located at the mouth of the Baltic Sea, it has long been the hub of trade between Scandinavia, Northern Europe, and Russia. Today, its very active port is co-managed with Sweden. We are two brother nations. Close to 30,000 Swedes come to Copenhagen every day to work. According to sociologists, Copenhagen is home to the happiest people in the world. Perhaps this is because the city is focused on the needs of its inhabitants, convenience and humanity. They have decided in the city council that th this city should be the best city for people in the world. The first thing that catches the eye in Copenhagen is its stunning architecture a breathtaking union of old and new. And then there are the bicycles, clearly the centerpiece of daily life for pretty much everyone. Every day, Copenhagen is bike around 1.2 million kilometers. port of Copenhagen is in reality over 400 years old. New Haven now thrives as the heart of the city, but this cozy inlet and the streets that surround it were once bustling with a different kind of energy. 50 years ago, this was part of Copenhagen where you would only meet drunken sailors and light-footed ladies. But today we call it the longest bar in Copenhagen. active monarchy in Europe, Denmark played an important role in the evolution of several other capital cities, and the Vikings that left this port actually set foot in America long before Christopher Columbus did. Everybody from, uh, from Copenhagen can go, can go and ski uh, and of course we don't have that much snow uh, in Denmark so uh, in summertime we have this fabric on the, on the roof itself where you can uh, summer ski all year round in bikinis if you like. 
Sustainability has always been a very big part of the Danish architecture business. Uh, we have some very, very strong demands uh, in uh, written that we need to follow. And so, so it's also something that every architect in Denmark has grown up with. Uh, so of course it is a, a, a big thing uh, in every project that we do. We make our way to Ørestad, a brand new neighborhood built around a train that doesn't require a driver. Of course, we didn't need the train. We had our bikes. Tell me about Orestad. Is that the place of tomorrow? It's a new part of town, and I think as every new part of town, it will take some years before it get it really gets sort of uh, atmosphere and and, uh, and everything. It's mainly people that want to experience something new, that want to try to live not as everybody else, but uh, that are open to uh, to something. Uh, Extraordinary. Urestad seems to be the land of architectural opportunity and experimentation. The Mountain Dwellings project is a prime example. You have a, a parking house underneath that is then sort of acts almost like a foundation for, for putting these apartments on top of. I think it's very much about sort of this idea of having some extra. Apartments doesn't need to be, you know, in a certain way. There's there's way of expanding that universe. So the car park is sort of elevating all these 80 flats up, and all of them has almost like a hundred square meters of garden in front. The apartments is facing this terrace, and then you have this peak sticking out. So every apartment in the project have 180 view of uh, Copenhagen city in front of them. As you can see, it's uh, quite a huge roof. All of the water which is falling on the building itself is collected in a big tank. And if it stays dry for a few weeks, the plants grow without adding water from the outside. Self-sustainable. Yeah. <laughs> nice. We can go and see if you want. I would love to. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go. These are 260 parking spots. And they're all, all sort of laid out as this mountain slope. You can even sort of, you have this mountain path coming all the way up. Um, and then in the middle of the building, there's this sort of inclined elevator taking you up to the floor that you want to go to. It was quite a nice idea that people could relate directly to a floor just by the color itself. Basically, every room is sort of oriented towards this uh, terrace uh, in the middle of the house. It almost becomes like this extra living room of your own home. Here you have complete uh, sort of privacy, and uh, if we move further out, you become the part of this sort of uh, the urban garden, and now we're on the sixth floor, and I think today uh, we can almost uh, see Sweden in the background. At the point where the city meets the countryside, we reach the spectacular Eight House. In true Copenhagen style, we make our way to the top of this 10-story building without ever getting off our bikes. It's not like Tour de France or anything, but uh, we need some power in the legs. Well, it's the first time I've biked up a building. Let's just <laughs> say that. <laughs> I have to admit, I've never seen anything quite <laughs> like this in my whole life. As you can see, we are sort of uh, on ninth floor. We were able to bike up. All the elevators has been dimensioned so that you can bring in your bike. Uh, and the mailman can sort of bring his mail to right to your front porch uh, just by bringing his bike up here. What was amazing when we were biking up is that people were sitting on their terraces, which are on a slope and basically having a drink and playing with the kids. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a little community here. Yeah, it is. But, it, but the, I think that's also one of the sort of the very uh, uh, positive things about uh, the outcome of this building is that people actually uh, stay in their front uh, yard and, be, and, and sort of take part in this uh, community all the way to the 10th floor. So, so it's, uh, it's almost like we are, are putting all the, the layers of a, of a dense city on top of each other and 
creating this, uh, this uh, small community out here. The Eight House is a modern take on an old British housing concept still found in areas of Copenhagen. The potato rows, as they're called here, are narrow residential streets that make for a cozy and intimate neighborhood life. When you integrate this idea in a residential complex, it looks like this. It has 630 flats, so it, it is becoming a little community. And you can say, see that the people are taking a, a small walk on the, on the facades of the building. And you have a pasture yes, over uh, here with cows yes, grazing. Exactly. Basically, this will not change. This is a conserved no. area. Yes, it, it's, it's part of sort of a, a future Copenhagen that will never change. Everything in Copenhagen is designed to make life more efficient and enjoyable. And according to surveys, the Danes are the happiest people in the world. Sociologist Emilia van Heuwen travels the world to speak about Danish well-being. With her, I try to identify what makes life here so enjoyable. Copenhagen keeps getting ranked number one in the world in surveys about happiness and well-being. Why? <laughs> yeah, because we have a welfare system that works very good, and um, we have the highest degree of women uh, working in the world, and that makes a very equal society too. Then we have a very high degree of uh, education, and, and people think they have a kind of uh, responsibility to be happy themselves and uh, that's what they try to do. There's a lot of factors that uh, makes you feel secure, and that means that you don't have to, to preoccupy about a lot of things uh, if, if your life is not going the, the, the right direction and so forth, because there's always someone to take care of you. If you don't have a job economically, there will always be some kind of help for you. They wanted to make a system secure for the people who really couldn't, who didn't have the measures and, and resources to do it. At the same time, we have this system that we support the young people who are studying. Uh, they get money from the state to be able to, to study instead of working. And everybody's allowed to university. You don't pay any money to go to university. And uh, it has made some kind of um, social uh, equalness. They have the right to enter the colleges to have some kind of other education. And, and that equals also our society, of course. Are you the most highly taxed country in Europe? Uh, not only in Europe, I think. We are, I think, the most highly taxed country in the world, yes. You heard that right. The happiest people in the world are also some of the most heavily taxed people in the world. The cost of living in Denmark and in Copenhagen is very high. Yeah, and that's because we also have quite high salaries uh, compared to a lot of other countries. And of course it has something to do with this uh, secure system that we have, the welfare system, that um, we earn a lot of money and we pay a lot of money of taxes to be sure that the whole society is actually working. And then of course we have very high costs for, for, for living. Uh, housing is expensive here? Housing is very expensive, but at the same time, housing is one of the most important issues for a Dane. People live very much in their houses, they invite each other to their houses, and a lot of people are living alone too. We have a lot of uh, people who are maybe in, in relationships, but they, have, they keep their own apartment or their own house uh, instead of moving together. So we need a lot of houses <laughs> in Denmark. Perhaps this cocooning nature explains the unique state of well-being the Danes cherish, the hug. There was one a foreigner that, that said that the Danes are very strange people. They light a candle and then they worship a god called Hygge. <laughs> and what you do is that you kind of, uh, you cozy together, you know, you get together and then lighting a candle, eating something nice, having, you know, a, moving together and, and making a nice atmosphere, not discussing and debating or anything, but just, you know, cocooning together 
uh, in a way that the outs you know the outside world is not a part of it. If you have a Latin people who wants to debate, then he ruins the hygge. So hygge is like a feeling of well-being surrounded by family. Yeah, and secureness too. That you feel secure, and, and it is a ritual. It is a ritual that we do. You, you can almost not hygge without uh, lighting candles, for instance. It's like when you light a candle, then you you start the ritual of having a hygge. One of the most striking expressions of the local search for well-being, the passion for quality food. Klaus Meyer spearheaded a movement promoting the rediscovery of Nordic cuisine. The new Nordic cuisine is all about the transformation of our culinary culture. We're going back to our roots and giving them a modern twist. The food we eat should take our climate and location into consideration. We celebrate what nature has to offer throughout the year. And we try to limit the distance between the garden and the table. No one said we couldn't cook the ingredients, but if everything is transformed, we lose the essence of the produce. That's not Nordic cuisine. One of the defining elements of Nordic cuisine is the idea of sharing everything. Nothing is a secret. The more we give, the more we receive. It's karma, yes. We also want to redefine what we call luxury. One of our greatest luxuries is actually our know-how and our awareness that this or that plant is free and accessible to all. But we have to find the plant and have the guts to use it. The pleasures of food are there for everyone to enjoy. More than half of the dishes at Noma are made with humble and simple ingredients, and people love it. It isn't about the cost of the ingredients, it's more about the time invested in the preparation, the interaction with the client, and the general interest for our dishes. They all contribute to creating an extraordinary moment. We don't make our point by serving caviar. It's not very subtle. Klaus's restaurant, Noma, was voted best restaurant in the world two years in a row by the San Pellegrino Guide. Yet the wowing dishes created by its chef René Redzepi radiate with simplicity. The ingredients on the menu come largely from its private gardens and from the abundant waters that surround the city. We're going through a big change in our approach to eating. The modern consumer considers himself as a co-producer. Look over there. We prepared this field and wrote on our web page that people could rent 60 square meters, receive a training, and have a feast when we harvest in September. In less than 36 hours, they were all rented. People come here from the city on a train twice a week with their tools to take care Copenhagen. Translated from Danish, it means the merchant's harbor. Located at the mouth of the Baltic Sea, it has long been the hub of trade between Scandinavia, Northern Europe, and Russia. Today, its very active port is co-managed with Sweden. We are two uh, brother nations. Close to 30,000 Swedes come to Copenhagen every day to work. According to sociologists, Copenhagen is home to the happiest people in the world. 
Perhaps this is because the city is focused on the needs of its inhabitants, convenience and humanity. They have decided in the city council that th this city should be the best city for people in the world. The first thing that catches the eye in Copenhagen is its stunning architecture, a breathtaking union of old and new. And then there are the bicycles, clearly the centerpiece of daily life for pretty much everyone. Every day, Copenhagen is bike around 1.2 million kilometers. Thank you.